Good afternoon and welcome to the System Design and Management webinar series. The System Design and Management program is a mid-career master's degree program that's jointly offered by MIT School of Engineering and the MIT Sloan School of Management. The SDM program provides a systems thinking perspective that integrates management, technology, and social sciences to address rapidly accelerating complexity and change in today's global market. Graduates earn a Master of Science degree in Engineering and Management. The SDM program also offers a one-year certificate in systems and product development. We are pleased to have Dr. Ellen Chaika present today on using systems dynamic models to make better decisions. Dr. Chaika applies her interest in data-driven decision-making as the head of R&D for Gamaya. Gamaya is a precision agriculture startup that uses machine learning on hyperspectral imagery to help farmers increase their yield while reducing their use of agrochemicals. She holds a PhD from MIT and two master's degrees, one in engineering management, received as a graduate of MIT system design and management program, and one in applied statistics from the University of Oxford. Ellen will present for approximately 45 minutes and then we'll open up the webinar for questions. Please use the chat feature on the webinar to ask questions and we'll respond to as many as possible. Please join me in welcoming Ellen Chaika for her talk today. Thank you. Hello, hi. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, as Jen said, I'm an SDM alumna, so I'm always uh, you know, quite proud to, to participate and be part of SDM events. Uh, today I'll talk to you about my doctoral research, uh, well, part of it, and this part is about using system dynamics models to make better decisions. Uh, especially since sustainability decisions. So we'll contextualize a bit with the question, what is sustainability? And many of you probably already have this answered at hand. It's humanity has the ability to make development sustainable, to ensure that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this is from the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1987. A lesser known part of that same document, I think is quite illuminating and the question it can help address is to how do we become more sustainable and they continue that sustainable development is not a fixed state of harmony but rather a process of change in which the exploitation of exploitation of resources the direction of investments the orientation of technological development and institutional change are made consistent with future as well as present needs we do not pretend that the process is easy or straightforward painful choices have to be made so what's involved in these painful choices? Well, they're very often multiple parties making decisions together. Sustainability decisions are also frequently, they frequently involve some sort of issues that are determined by physical world constraints and some that are influenced by the stakeholders' interests alone. Sustainability decisions also often contain some trade-off and some win-win issues. So models can integrate different kinds of issues. For example, those that we just mentioned, the physical world and stakeholder interest issues, as well as trade-off and win-win. And really quickly here, trade-off uh, issues are when in order to gain in one, you have to give up in another. And win-win means you can gain in both simultaneously. And sometimes it's more than just two variables. Uh, so many researchers point out that models can help decision makers with um, with such decisions, decisions that have issues mixing physical world and stakeholder interests, as well as trade-off and win-win. Though there are some researchers who find evidence that decision makers are not using models as often as the model, build model builders anticipated. So what can be done to get more decision makers to use models? Well, there's a lot of research showing that collaborative model building can help. So in basically involving those decision makers in the model building process having them create the model alongside experts or on their own. And by participating in the modeling process, decision makers learn about the enviro-socio-technical system in which the decision is contextualized. So that's a pretty big word, so just a moment to, to digest that. It's the environment, the society, and also the technical system in which something is happening. And in SDM, we talk about that quite a lot, that confluence of, of overlapping uh, systems that are pretty massive. Uh, so continuing there, there are many case studies in which uh, in-depth research has been done to, to look at how to apply a collaborative modeling process to a real-world decision. So the, the case study method is, is uh, a very involved process where the researcher either works alongside 
the real world stakeholders or observes them. Uh, but it's usually uh, an observation or a participation in a real world happening. Another way we can uh, get more models, more decision makers to use models is to build models in a way that increases their usefulness and usability. There's a lot of research that focuses on just how should we build those models and what characteristics would increase their usefulness and or usability. There's a, an interesting assumption here that the research I'll talk to you today about challenges, and that's that by focusing on the model creation process as a means to address the lack of model uptake, any research that does, show, does so relies on the assumption that model use helps decision makers make decisions. So that's what we're gonna look into today is what is the impact of using a model in a sustainability decision? And we're gonna try to quantify that. We'll, we'll show you some, some different ways to quantify that. And then how does model use compare to other often used decision tools? So obviously decision makers have been making decisions for quite a long time and in quite a lot of settings. So what other tools are they using and how do models compare? So how do we address these open questions? Uh, just a quick methods slide here. We'll use this, or I'll use a serious game experiment. Uh, that, so those are quite nice because they allow the social interactions to be more natural while also still allowing the researchers to control certain important variables. So it adds a, a nice kind of real world-ish feel, but also the control of an experiment. Uh, these serious games and the experiments using them can come in many forms, such as management, management flight simulators, which many of you might have used in uh, classes at the Sloan School, war games for military training, again, some of you may have done that, uh, or role play simulations. These are often used in negotiating classes um, and other ways to teach leadership skills, that sort of thing. And again, some of you may have, have um, participated or written some of these. To follow up on um, how these methods fit together, if you look at the bottom left, I don't know if you can see my mouse, the bottom left here, um, some of the weaknesses of the case study method include that they're not able to compare multiple instances within the same context. They're observing one real thing and they, they have only that one real thing or one real happening. Uh, they're also less able to empirically compare counterfactual conditions. So they can't create a parallel stream as it were and try one thing in one and something else in another. But luckily the experimental method enables comparison of these multiple instances in the same context as well as consideration, empirical consideration of counterfactual conditions. Every method has its weakness, and the weaknesses of the experiment, experimental method include using an artificial setting that may not reflect the real world, and also they simplify the context and use representatives of the real world decision makers and stakeholders. So it's not the actual people who are involved in the real world thing. Um, but the strengths of the case study method mitigate that because they do allow incredible depth of inquiry into ongoing real world contexts, and they also use the real world decision makers and stakeholders. So this study can partner with studies that have come before and will come after that, are, that use the case study method. Uh, in, in this study, I'm able to look at some counterfactual and give different decision makers different tools to address the same problem. So what is the impact of using a model in a sustainability decision? So these are, that's the overarching research question and then the how part. So does model use impact the outcomes of sustainability decisions that involve multiple interests and a mixture of trade-off and win-win? And if so, how? So two kind of more lower level questions that we can get, you know, some, we can grapple with a little bit and create hypotheses out of is does model use compared to other decision tools, which we'll talk about later, increase the participant's ability to create a policy that does what they want it to do? And does model use, compared to these other decision tools, increase participants' ability to, to reach the set of optimal policy outcomes? So we create hypotheses out of these, which uh, for hypothesis one is model use will increase the likelihood that decision makers create a policy that reaches their stated initial priorities. And hypothesis two, model use will increase the likelihood that decision makers create a policy whose outcome is on the Pareto frontier of achieved outcomes. So both these hypotheses can be shown to be uh, not supported or supported is what make, uh, makes them nice hypotheses because they can be, they're testable. And before we um, get into those model 
uh, sorry, those um, decision tools. Let's talk a little bit about how decision makers assess decision tools. There are, there's a three-pronged framework that works really well, and it's based on the decision maker's assessment. So it's from the decision maker's point of view and their assessment of these decision tools. The first is credibility, which is how accurate and valid the decision maker assesses the decision tool to be. And then there's salience, which is how relevant to the decision at hand the decision maker assesses the decision tool to be. And then legitimacy is the decision maker's assessment of how well the decision tool includes multiple perspectives and treats them in an unbiased manner. Credibility, salience, and legitimacy impact a decision tool's influence on a decision maker's actions. So what they actually do, what decision they take. And Posner and, and uh, co-authors have, just, have uh, demonstrated that legitimacy is, is the most influential and credibility is the least, meaning salience is in the middle. So taking this, this foundation in, in this study, I hold credibility roughly constant and very legitimacy and salience, which are the two that have stronger influence on the decision maker's actions. So the decision tools. The first is model use. The second is a briefing about the logic of the model. The third is briefing about energy sustainability, so general energy. And the fourth is a briefing that's completely unrelated to the policy setting. And I abbreviate these as model, model, log model logic, general energy, and control. I asked the participants to rate the credibility, salience, and legitimacy both before and after they used the tools. When they rated it before, they didn't even know which one they had been randomly assigned. So they were, they were rating what they thought generally a, a decision tool should be. And the ratings across uh, the, the different tools are very similar. They're statistically sig significantly, or sorry, they're statistically um, similar to each other than no statistic statistically significant, significant differences. So they are the same. The differences show up in the post ratings and in a way that we were trying to create, my, my co-author and I. Uh, we held credibility roughly, uh, credibility roughly constant. Uh, so the 39, 3.9, 3.8, 3.9, 3.8 are statistically similar to each other. Salience, we wanted to vary, and indeed, the, the, the participants, the decision makers, rated salience in a de decreasing manner, a strictly decreasing manner, 4.3, 3.8, 3.5, 2.9. Legitimacy, it's uh, monotonically decreasing, so it, it doesn't increase, but 3.6, 3.2, 3.2, and 2.9. So we did create the intervention we were trying to create, which was holding credibility constant, and changing salience and legitimacy of the decision tools. So how did we operationalize these decision tools? Well, the first is we gave them a model, which I'll tell you about on the next slide, had them play with it for, for 20 minutes, and then enter their policy. Uh, for the model logic group, they watched a movie about the logic of the model. And movies are basically briefings that are the same every time. So in an experiment, we can give each person the exact same criteria or great the exact same circumstance as everyone else in their category. General Energy was a compilation of three different movies about just general energy and sustainability. And the fourth was a control that was completely unrelated to the policy setting. The En-ROADS model, which is a fantastic model built by Climate Interactive and uh, Professor John Sturman of the MIT Sloan School and IDSS. It's um, based on system dynamics and it's as such graphical. This is a um, visual representation and this is the interface that the participants interacted with. Along the bottom here you have what are called the policy levers. So the individual decision makers could click on these, these bars and slide them and, and change their values and as they did so they would see the plots update. This is static, this is a picture so it wouldn't, it wouldn't move if I tried but it's um, allows immediate feedback as a person tries different options and is um, you know, quite visual giving graphs. There, there are other graphs here that they can click on. So what did the 105 participants who played the 3E game, what did they do? So they were role playing as the Minister of Sustainability making a global sustainability policy, uh, the same policy, all of them. Uh, they were randomly assigned a decision tool they created a policy with 15 inputs measured on three outputs. 
And they, those three outputs are the change in average global surface temperature in the year 2100 in degrees Celsius, the percentage of global population with access to electricity in the year 2050, and the gross world product in 2100, also, uh, sorry, that's in trillions of US dollars. The percentage of world population with access to electricity is earlier, it has an earlier deadline than the other two because people without electricity don't wanna have to wait. They want it as soon as they can get it. Uh, so the, the benefit is in the sooner the better. Whereas with the temperature and the gross world product, we were, we're taking a longer term, you know, we need the temperature to stay low for the long term as well, and the gross world product to be high for the long term. So actually one more thing on this slide. Uh, we, we, in this study, my co-author and I did have the best case scenario. We said, okay, if we're gonna measure this, let's start with the best case scenario. And that's that the model well describes reality. And in this case, the, the kind of artificial reality of um, this world we put participants into. So the model and reality were, um, were very close to each other slash identical to each other. So we are trying to see in an idealized setting, what is the model, what is the model's impact? So for H1, hypothesis one, uh, model use will increase the likelihood that decision makers create a policy that reaches their stated initial priorities. Uh, so looked at this through, um, you know, through modeling, through a, um, just a, you know, a regression equation. And we found that actually model users did not match the outcome their outcome to priority more readily than other participants. In fact, it was the model logic and general energy groups that did the best at matching their state of priority to, to their outcome. So a good question is why? So we looked a little bit more into those outcomes and discovered that actually 73% of the model users discovered the win-win nature of social equity. And this led them to over perform or outperform the, their priorities in social equity. So they discovered this win-win, they could get a whole lot of social equity, meaning they could give electricity away to people uh, through renewable sources without impacting the, the rise in, in global average surface temperature. And they could actually kind of help the economy because when people get access to electricity, they can study later in the evening, they can be more productive, um, Throughout the day, they can you know, extend their day longer. They can join the workforce. They have, higher, have better health, access to clean water. Uh, so it's, it's generally a positive for the economy as well. In comparison, these model logic folks, general energy and control, did not find the win-win the so readily. Uh, these guys, I think it was 13%, and these 7% found the win-win, and none of the control participants found the win-win. The so looking at another way to, to discuss the outcome, and that's how optimal it is, how, how, um, how good it is, if you will. And the Pareto Front is a nice mechanism for doing that. So it categorizes the trade space of achieved outcomes. And it's a, it, the Pareto Front is the set of points such that which to do better in any one dimension, the other dimensions would have to do worse. And I used um, a, a genetic algorithm based on Chong and Zach. Uh, there, there's many, but this is the one I happen to use. So we did find that in this case for H2 hypothesis two, the model use uh, model was, will increase the likelihood that decision makers create a policy whose outcome is on the Pareto front of achieved outcomes. So what we're looking at here with this plot is on the x-axis there's temperature, on the y-axis it's access to electricity, so that's the percent of the population. This one here temperature is in degrees Celsius, and the global economy is in trillions of U.S. dollars, and it's on the, the z-axis here. And it is, um, basically this is a, a plot of all of the points. Each of the outcome points were in three dimensions, this you know, temperature, access, and global economy. And the, we see here in the back a cluster of points. I'm, I'm circling them with my mouse. There are, um, these are all model users, which is, these are the model users discovering the win-win of social equity because they, they basically could have had a point like this one, closer in, uh, you know, lower on access, but why not give 100%? It doesn't really affect the, the temperature, make it worse, and it can improve the economy. So 
in a sense here we see um, you know basically the model users these blue ones are the the colored blue ones are the model users who are on the Pareto front the orange are the model logic who are on the Pareto front if there had been any general energy or any control they would have been colored pink and gray respectively these open circles are points that are not on the Pareto front so they're you know, they are basically what we would say dominated. They're dominated points. These, these non-dominated points form the front. And it's, <laughs> those dominated points are dominated by model users. But being on the Pareto front of achieved, out, achieved outcomes is not the same as reaching one's priorities. Again, we have the same temperature in degrees Celsius, access percent of population, the global economy in trillions of US dollars. Uh, this particular participant who is on the Pareto front, uh, this participant did not match his or her priority points. Uh, this person put 60 for the environment and only 40 for the, the economy, but they had the by far the highest uh, outcome in terms of global average economy, sorry, um, global economy in trillions of US dollars. They had the highest of all participants and they put among the lowest of priority points. Four was um, among the lowest of priority points. Um, and they put a, a pretty kind of higher than average amount for the environment, and yet they're among the, the top temperatures. So we, we could kind of reasonably say this person did not meet their priority points, yet they're on the Pareto frontier. Uh, this participant here, this, this uh, model logic participant, uh, we could say, did match their, their priority points. This person had uh, allocated 75%, uh, sorry, 75 uh, out of 100, so 75% of their priority points to the environment, and they achieved the lowest temperature of all the participants in the, in the study. Uh, however, it's, it's important to note that this person could have improved their outcome by giving 100% access to electricity. That would have moved their points approximately here, and they would have had um, you know, roughly the same temperature and possibly a little bit better in terms of global economy. So they could have improved their outcome by identifying that win-win, which they, they did not do. So we do find that um, model use does impact decision outcomes. Uh, so in this case, um, you know, I looked at, I asked the question, did model use increase participants' ability to create a policy matching their priorities? And the answer is no, uh, because they outperform their social equity measure by discovering the win-win, which one could argue actually this is a, a better outcome. They found something in, the, in the, the, the trade space, if you will, that allowed them to outperform what they even thought they could do. It allowed them to, to in a negotiating lingo, you might say, uh, to gain more value uh, from, the, from the decision. Participants who were briefed on the model logic or on the general energy information did, did the best in matching their, their state of their priorities. They, um, you know, they were the leaders there. Did model use increase participants' ability to create an optimal policy? Yes. Uh, the model users reached the Pareto front of achieved outcomes more readily than the other participants. Uh, they were followed closely by those who were briefed about the model logic, but they, they did outperform them. So talking about uh, applying these to real world sustainability decisions. So what if it's not possible for decision makers to create a model? So that's uh, still um, considered the best approach, I'd say, uh, according to the research, is to involve the decision makers in co-creating the model. Uh, that can be done through a participatory modeling process, through um, a joint fact finding that's kind of model focused, there are several different names for and different processes, slightly different processes for involving the, the decision maker, the person with the authority to make the decision or people with the authority to make the decision in the modeling process. And it's, you know, there are many benefits that are, that are espoused there, which include, as we discussed earlier, learning about the system, you know, its, its socio, enviro, and technical characteristics understanding what, um, what, the, what the limits are, understanding what the boundaries are, uh, 
seeing what's what causality there might be in, in, in time and space that you know, might not be kind of juxtaposed in time and space. So basically applying a lot of the systems thinking principles that, that we talk a lot about in SDM. So it's, it's still, for those reasons, uh, considered, considered best. It also allows the decision makers to understand each other's perspectives. So imagine a, a really large multi-party decision where there are people who have different perspectives on things, um, often things that they care very passionately about. And through a modeling process, they could focus on, through a collaborative modeling process, they could focus on seeing what they do agree on, seeing what the, what the overlaps are, seeing how each other sees the situation. Because if they, if they understand how somebody they might think wants opposite things from them, they might discover that that's not the case or not the case across the board. There might be some room for creating some trades, you know, where they could, each, each party could get something that, that's most important to them if they give up something that's of lesser importance. Uh, so it really opens up that ability to, to, to see the situation for the, the participants the, to get involved in understanding it and each other. But it's not always possible. And so when it's not, it's, it's uh, I would say, very encouraged to have the decision maker actually sit down behind a model. Ideally, a model like, like En-ROADS or, or another system dynamics model where the feedback is, is so, so immediate and it, it's, it's also graphical or visual. And so the, the person here, again, this is a static picture, but the person could drag in the, in the real live model when they're simulating it, they could drag these different variables and change the values and see how it affects the outcomes they're trying to, to achieve. There are, in, in this model, it's, it's quite complex, so there are a lot of different output variables that they could take into account, and a, a decision maker sitting behind it would, would be able to see, okay, if I, if, I, you know, if I press for, if I really, really care about the emissions price, for example, then what does that do to the rest of the things I care about? Or what does that do to the things that I know my, my um, co-decision makers care about? You know, maybe somebody from a different party. It allows them to really, really understand it and, 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 and see it first, see it uh, uh, firsthand, see it in quotes, because obviously it's, it's see it through a model. Uh, so getting them to sit down would be fantastic. Although also that is not always possible because decision makers are busy people. Um, they may not be, may not, may not feel entirely comfortable sitting down behind a model. A lot of a lot of, especially in, in the way of uh, public policy, uh, they come through a public policy education program, which may or may not include science and, and mathematics and statistics, or, or it may have been a while. So they may be a little less inclined to sit behind a model. Um, and that's, you know, that's not the end of the world. We have a suggestion for, um, for that as well, which is um, when it's not possible for decision makers to use the model, then brief them about what, it, what you found out when you use the model, how the model was structured, you know, especially a credible, salient, and legitimate model. What did you discover in it? In this case, it might be just describing the win-win of giving electricity through renewable means to people who are currently without it and describing what happens when you do so. You know, they, you know, as we talked earlier, they can uh, join the workforce, work later, have better health, et cetera. Um, because we've discovered that using a model uh, has several advantages. It increases the likelihood of reading, reaching the Pareto front of achieved outcomes, and it increases the likelihood of identifying a win-win, uh, which, which is particularly important in uh, very complex systems because they may not be the obvious ones. So um, I'd like to... Thank my committee, my doctoral committee, uh, Professor Noel Saline, Professor Olivier Devec, Ali Devec, uh, Professor Overshrone, and Dr. Edgar Blanco, uh, CCS, who funded the 3E game, my colleagues and mentors in IDSS, DESP, Sloan, and elsewhere at MIT and Harvard, of course, the SDM program, uh, such a wonderful master's, and all my, my colleagues in the SDM program, and everyone who took a turn as the Minister of Sustainability in the 3E game, i.e. the participants. Obviously couldn't have done it without the participants. And here are references. And are there any questions? So we actually have a number of questions that have come in and I'm gonna just walk through, but for those that are listening, feel free to add any additional questions to the chat box and we'll just work our way through the list. Now the first one that I have for you 
is um, what do you see as the most important or the most common impediments or obstacles to more widespread use of SD, ST models in decision making and policy making processes? Wow, that's a really good question. And um, I think one, one important um, hurdle to, to overcome is that to create a credible, salient, legitimate model, it takes a while. And especially if you're going to involve the decision makers, that, that takes a whole process because it has to be quite well structured. They have to, uh, there have to be meeting times, as it were, where people come together and there has to be discussion about what data goes into the, to using or into, you know, into creating the model. There has to be a discussion of uh, the behavior of the model, the boundaries of the model, and it can take quite a while. And of course, it's probably being scheduled with people who are very busy doing other things. So it, it can, I would say, stretch out a little bit and that, that time commitment can be, um, can be a big hurdle. But even if it's an expert created model, you know, where the experts do it on their own um, without the involvement of the, the decision makers who ultimately use it, it's still a long process. It still has to be tested and retested and validated and verified. And that um, is non-trivial and things can change when, while that process is happening. So in a certain way, the process itself is the hurdle, I guess, because to create a credible standard and uh, legitimate model requires such a long process, but to not follow that process means the models of lesser value. So in a, in a bit, that's a, in a bit of a way of looking at it, it's a paradox, but it's um, one that I think we do have to overcome. And even though it takes a little bit longer, I'd say still involving the decision makers is the better way to go because they, they learn throughout that process. And they also provide really incredible insight in terms of the way they see certain interactions or, or, or certain um, happenings in the system that they're, that, you know, they're a part of that they live in. Uh, so to summarize, it's, the, it's the, the rigorous process that's required, I think delays then um, when the model's available. So the next question that I have is for the four approaches, what's the difference in time or dollars to create each decision tool? The useful model is perceived to take more money, therefore investment for a better decision tool may not be funded. Really good question. Um, and here's, well, let's talk about that. Yeah, no, really good question. And I, it relates very strongly to the question just asked about um, you know, hurdles or whatever in, in getting system dynamics or other models used in a policy setting. And absolutely, in, in this slide showing now shows the decision tools that I compared and model, the model has to be created. And it's really, really in, um, in, uh, an intense process. For the briefing, you know, in this case, the briefing actually is dependent on the model being, being ready to use, being validated and verified. So um, that also still has that same time component, uh, but creating a briefing, um, is a little bit easier. So let's say there is a, a model out there that, that policymakers have relied on and it's still up to date or new data is, is included, uh, then briefings can be made using that, that model with those new data, simulating the model and explaining it. And so you know, that's the, I don't know, eight-ish hours it takes to, to create a really solid briefing. Um, briefing about general energy, uh, those I would say are a little bit faster because the experts tend to know the information and, and where to um, reference it kind of already. So I'd say that that's a little bit of a faster process. Uh, and obviously the controls are not really relevant because that uh, was completely unrelated to the policy setting. So I guess the two comparisons are then model use and briefing, but then there are different kinds of briefings and they take different amounts of time. And in terms of getting them funded, um, obviously models require a lot more, uh, not only because they take more time, but also because data might have to be collected or um, external parties needing to, to verify or validate. Um, so yeah, that is, it is a more, more intense experience. Um, that said, then if, if you do have, have that investment, somebody you know, puts the time in, puts the effort in and creates a model, then 
even if it can't be used by decision makers around the world, other decision makers could still, or their support staff rather, could still create a briefing for that decision maker using that model. So it's in a certain way uh, multipliable, if you will. Um, a general energy briefing, I would say, is probably already happening. Uh, it's probably part of the support staffs I and mean, expert staffs um, daily daily job anyway. So I'd obviously I'd say that has the lowest the lowest funding. Um, but if I were to argue to try to get funding to do a system dynamics model, I would I would I guess explain the the multiplicative effect of not only will it help our particular decision makers, but it will help um, others and we can add new data. I would, you know, you, you could talk about how the, how you, your plan for making the model updatable, how to, how to make um, new data, how to make it simulatable with new data. Um, yeah, I would, I would say that that would uh, hopefully be successful <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a grant funding application. So there's a follow-up question. I, I, I skipped a couple, and I'll go back to those. But there was a follow-up question as you spoke on on responding to that, and it was, which software can you suggest to build these models? Great question. Um, so there are several for system dynamics. Um, I'm most familiar with Venison. Uh, there's an educational uh, license available, and then there are also for commercial entities paid licensings. Um, but I, I quite like it. It's uh, the interface looks a little bit like. Whoops. Here we go. Um, this is this was made with Venison, but again, there are others. And System Dynamics, for those who um, who aren't quite sure what it is, it's it's basically based on differential equations, so change happening over time. And it's um, there. There's a, a, a kind of fundamental concept of System Dynamics models about stocks and flows. So quantities of things moving from one place to another. You can think of it a little bit like. Um, you know, a bank account, money coming in, staying in the account, and then, and then leaving when you purchase something. Or another kind of traditional uh, analogy is the bathtub. If you, you, know, you turn on the faucet, and if you have the plug closed, the, the bathtub fills up. And you can open the plug, and the bathtub will drain, but if it's filling up faster than it's draining, it'll still keep gaining. Um, or if it's draining faster than it's filling, it'll, it'll drain. Um, so it's it's that idea of stock and flow, but there are also causal loops that are quite instrumental, and in, and in, in basically um, they can form lots of different different um, you know, shapes, I guess. <laughs> but you know, different kinds of loops. You know, we talk about a reinforcing loop, or um, you know, that, like some people call those positive positive reinforcing. Uh, so there are different kinds of relationships that these variables can have. All right, so I'm going to bounce back a little bit, and, and there were two questions that are similar, so I am going to combine them. Feel free to separate out if there's nuances here. And it said, ST models require explicit, explicit differential or difference relationships. No data or little data often means no meaningful model. And, and to follow on to that by the same person said, adoption of ST modeling methodology has been sparse because of a lack of data as well as model complexity. What's changed or what's different now that makes this useful? That's a really good question. And you're right. I mean, there's that kind of famous saying of uh, garbage in, garbage out. You know, it, you, you have to have good data. I mean, data are <laughs> really fundamental. And depending on what you're trying to model, you can require quite a lot of data. And it's, of course, you know, then you have to find data of repeatable sources or collect it yourself, which is, is you know, would require that data collection protocol, it, it, it's um, possibly an experiment. Um, so yeah, there's, I don't think that's, it's definitely not changed yet and I'm not sure it ever will because the data are so fundamental to, to what's, what's being done with a model. You're, you know, you're simulating, I mean, I don't know that that can be gotten around, the fact that we really need good data. Um, can you, I'm sorry, John, can you repeat the second part of the question, please? Sure, it was um, adoption of SD modeling methodology has been sparse because of lack of data as well as model complexity and what's changed. I think you may have already answered it, but feel free to go at that. Yeah, I think I think so. I, and I mean, I guess if someone who particularly likes the way system dynamics models uh, represent the world, I think what's really helpful about them is the the change over time, you know, they and and the 
the fact that you you basically can explore relationships that you might not otherwise be able to. Uh, so it's you know it's in a certain way it's like the model language of systems thinking, uh, where it's important to 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 think about what's really influencing what and what is and how how is that how is that happening what's the relationship and can it be described mathematically which is where you can can then um, you know actually create the the the, the model um, there's an, a related type of modeling called agent based modeling which focuses kind of if you will on the um, it's usually used for like you know modeling people or populations of animals, and it's it, so it's focused on the the entity, if you will. Uh, the kind of one way I like to think about it is the what that's moving between the stocks and the flows. Uh, so looking at you know um, crowd control or um, you know animal populations, that sort of thing, and it's you know in a nice way very complementary to system dynamics, and I think um, you know possibly the two reinforce each other in terms of the information that they can help one understand about about a system you're trying to model and it's um like for yeah yeah i guess that's i guess that's good um okay next question please all right so the next question that i have is can you compare and contrast sd modeling to alternative mcdm methods such as ahp um I would say I'm probably not the best person to answer that question, really. Um, if you can you can you forward that to me and I'll I'll um I have a friend who who I think would be better and I can respond to the person more thoroughly and connect them to my friend if that's if that's helpful. Definitely would that. I, I'd be more than happy to pull the contact and send that over to you. So let me move on Thank to the you. next one. Uh, Decision-making processes, such as stakeholders involved, time available, uncertainties, vary widely depending on several factors, including the type of business, the impact of the outcomes. So how does your results take this into account? And how do we create a better or universal framework to inform the decision process? So a universal format to inform the decision process. Um, I'm going to start with that piece of the question. It is, um, well, first of all, I think we have to say that all, all decisions could possibly be considered individual, but I do think there are a lot of similarities. And what my research has shown me is that a, a robust, inclusive, and effective decision process should include heavy participation from the decision makers and from the decision makers of different kind of parties, if you will, to use that negotiation term, but different uh, perspectives within the, within the decision. Uh, you might, they might even be kind of competing camps, as it were, you know, if, they, if they're in disagreement about something. And I think that's particularly important because if, if we create a decision process that doesn't take these voices into account, uh, the voices will find some way to be heard, whether they you know, protest the decision or sabotage it or um, you know, form their own entity and, and, and make a counter decision. Uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, only a matter of time before that happens. And it's, it's I think, an important piece of any decision-making process to acknowledge that and to say, okay, you know, here's, here's how we see it, but here, how, here is how different people see it and how to kind of make that all fit together if you as it were into one decision um if you you know if you if you take kind of the maybe a most uh contentious environment for that might be like um you know where one party's suing another party and you know then they still have they or the judge who's hearing their case has a decision to make uh yet if we bring those parties to a media through a mediation process uh, they very often can reach their own resolution, their own decision, as it were, uh, by having some, some you know, facilitation, having some mediators ask them about their underlying assumptions and hearing each other's underlying assumptions. And through that learning process, they can come to maybe see their disagreement differently. So that's, that's kind of a very contentious decision-making process. You know, there, obviously, there are other kinds where 
it's maybe more pragmatic in terms of uh, there's a, you know, a, a problem to be solved. And yet sometimes those can actually be a little contentious as well as people have different opinions or uh, different solutions might favor different parties over others. Um, so again, I keep coming back to you, but I, I really strongly believe this, that a systems thinking approach is, is very, very helpful for, for navigating any sort of decision process and, and includes, I'd say, designing the decision process. All right, Ellen, the next question comes in. It says, like in engineering, some model parameters are dominant. Some might vary with time. To keep the model relevant, is it necessary to include feedback and feed the model with past assumptions and measurements? I think that depends on the model, but generally, I would say expect it to. Um, you know, kind of ask a question. If you really don't think it's happening, ask yourself why. Because feedback is kind of a fundamental property of, of many, um, well, I mean, it's, it's a very, very important part of uh, systems thinking and system dynamics um, for the reason that it tends to be observed in, in the vast array of contexts or systems, if you will, that have been modeled. Uh, so I would, um, I would question, you know, if I, if I thought I were modeling something that didn't, that showed that it wasn't, that they weren't important, I would, I would look a little deeper. All right. Uh, next question. Is there a connection between your SD modeling and the system one and system two decision concepts in Daniel Kahneman's work? Oh, it's been a while since I've really gone on work. Um, <laughs> I was hoping you knew what I was talking about. <laughs> no, it, I do. I do know what he's been, or he or she's been talking about, but it's been a while. Um, could the could the person refresh my memory about the system one and system two? I don't know if we've got the flexibility on the chat room to be able to do that. Um, so okay. it may be something okay. that I, I, again, put you in touch with afterwards. Happily, yeah, that would be great. And I, 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 it would be a nice, it's a good opportunity for me to refresh my memory on that. Um, so I'm gonna actually just do a quick shout out to the, those that are on the call because that is the last question I have in the, in the list here. If there are uh, further, oh, sorry, there was somebody else that said not, not a question, but a hint to the standard methods which can be applied to dynamic, dynamic complex questions. Again, I don't know if you, you know what that is, but if there's any other questions while we, we, we wrap this up, um, please use that chat feature um, and I'll, I'll leave it open for a couple more minutes. Um, I do have one more that just came in, Ellen, and it says, how do you typically validate the relationships that are fed into the model, considering that in the real world, so many variables change together and suggest correlation, yet may not be causative? Yes, absolutely. Um, correlation and causation are not the same thing, which many, many people say over and over for good reason. Um, absolutely. And it's, that is a really, again, that's one of those things you really, I think, have to pay attention to. So if, you, if you're seeing something that um, you, you think implies causation, you very possibly have to to think about another variable, because sometimes what might look like causation could actually be mediated by a, a, you know, a third or even set of other variables. Uh, so it is really tricky, I'd say. Um, there's, you know, of course, when you, you know, to your question, I think, extended into like the data gathering part of it. And, you know, that is um, obviously dependent on the methods, the, the measurement methods used. And, what ex knowing exactly what they were, what their limitations are, and what exactly they were measuring, because sometimes uh, people can mis you know misinterpret what the measurements are, thinking it's one thing and it's and, it, and it's not, uh, especially if it's data that they haven't themselves collected. Uh, so I think it's really important, and you know we haven't talked about this yet, but obviously if you're collecting different data sources like they they did for En-ROADS, you very often have to normalize it in a way. Um, that, well, not normalize it in a way, normalize it, full stop, uh, because in a way, when, you, when you're when you looking at these different data sources, it may not be clear um, what exactly, which, you know, what exactly you've got. So normalization can be a really important, um, really important piece, uh, and it can be, 
um, you know, it can be problematic when not done. Uh, so, so yes, it, it is important to remember correlation is not causation. Uh, that includes in modeling space, but as well as in statistics and other and other research. So, um, kind of always looking for it is, I guess, a good practice. So um, I don't have another uh, full question. There's somebody that has requested that or asked if this will be available later to re-listen to. And yes, we do post these webinars up on our website at sdm.mit.edu. It'll give us about a day to be able to, to download it and get it cleaned up so that it can post properly. But yes, we will have this available for anybody that's interested in re-listening or passing along to colleagues. Um, uh, Ellen, I think that is the end of the current questions that we have. So I'd love to take a minute and thank you very, very much for participating. It's always wonderful to have people that have furthered the research that they started here at SDM to come back and talk about some of their research and findings. Um, uh, I, actually, as I'm, as I'm doing my wrap up, there is another question that came in. If you've got just a couple more minutes, we can, we can take this one more and then I'll do my final thank you. Um, sure. This one says, how might you envision the use of new technologies such as IoT and AI to improve the data collection and relationship validation process? That's a really great question. I've, I'm, I've been thinking a lot about AI in particular recently, but uh, obviously that relates to IoT as well. Um, one of the things that that is possible, I think, is that AI actually uh, replaces the modeling process. Um, you know, the, in, what we talked about today was a system dynamics model where humans identified the relationships among the variables, but in like, for example, deep learning or other neural nets, the, it's actually done from the data themselves and you know, structures basically identified uh, by the computer, by the program. So that's a really amazing happening, but also obviously there'll probably be some regulation that's necessary to make sure that it's it's not used for ill efforts, you know, for ill towards the ill, um, but it it does mean that lots and lots of new data sets can be worked with in ways that maybe wasn't previously possible. Um, you know, I studied AI kind of late '90s, and <laughs> uh, so maybe hopefully not reveal exactly how old I am, but uh, at the time people were. It was very theoretical because there were not computers large enough to or capable enough to handle the large data sets needed. And now there are, and that's really, really exciting for all the uses that we can put to it and all the the ways that we can work with data that you know previously just, just weren't weren't quite possible. Um, so yeah, I think that's it is really gonna change how we do research, how we, uh, I think it's going to change a lot of jobs in industry. I think it's going to change uh, some jobs in government or some analyses in government and our, you know, public, the public space and, you know, in exciting and hopefully not so terrifying ways. But, you know, again, um, yeah, stay tuned. I think that's, it's, a, it's incredible. Uh, yeah, we're living in incredible times to be able to, to see this, this come about. Well, we've got a number of people that have sent in their thank yous, and I want to echo that, that it's wonderful to have you come back and talk. I think you've got a topic here that many people can relate to. It's, it's timely and it's, it's relevant to the discussion today. Um, to those that are listening, as I mentioned already, the webinar will be available for replay. Um, it may be later today, but more likely sometime tomorrow. Um, feel free to pass this along to your colleagues. And um, Ellen, um, much appreciated, and it's wonderful to have you back here with SDM. Thank you so much to everybody listening in to call, and uh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, and thank you to everyone. I, I you know, enjoy being back a part of the SDM community. Thanks. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Bye.